murders of six young women whose strangled, naked bodies were dumped on waste grounds in West London horrified 1960s Britain. The serial killer, dubbed Jack the Stripper, was never found, but now a journalist has come forward and he claims he has compelling evidence it was British world champion, boxer turned actor Freddie Mills, who was a Freemason. He believes that Mills admitted his guilt to Scotland Yard detective and was also a fellow Freemason who was in charge of the investigation. The first body, that of 30-year-old Hannah Talford, was found by the River Thames at Hammersmith in February 1964. Hannah, who had been strangled, was left with several teeth missing and the underwear she had been wearing wedged down her throat. This grim discovery sparked a string of similar cases. Five more women, all prostitutes, who were throttled and dumped on the Thames foreshore. The sadistic killer who knocked the women's teeth out while they were still alive and in many cases assaulted them has never been brought to justice. Former crime reporter Michael Litchfield says he has identified the fiend responsible alleging the murderer was Freddie Mills, a British world champion boxer. Litchfield's sensational claim is that Mills admitted his guilt to the detective in charge of the probe before having himself assassinated by the Cray twins to escape justice. Ralph Bourne Mills had been a suspect in the Metropolitan Police investigation into the so-called Hammersmith nude murders, but his guilt was never proved. Any hope of gaining a confession for the killings appeared to disappear when he was found shot dead by the wheel of his car in an apparent suicide. Long before the boxer became a subject of interest to the police investigation, the second body appeared. Irene Lockwood, 25, was found in April on the same stretch of riverbank where Hannah's corpse had been dumped. Several weeks later, passers-by came across the body of 22-year-old Helen Bartholomew in an alley. She had been strangled, just like the previous two victims. Then, in July, just up the river at Chiswick, the remains of 30-year-old Mary Fleming were found in a garage forecourt. The corpse of the fifth victim, Francis Brown, 21, was discovered in Kensington during November the same year. With five women all killed by strangulation and all left naked in the same manner, it was now clear police were hunting a serial killer. By this point, police were investigating hundreds of potential suspects, but officers had never considered Mills as a suspect, and there appeared to be no reason why they should suspect anything. Mills, a former milkman, was a widely respected public figure, admired as a model of sporting prowess after taking the Boxing World title in July 1948. This led to a lucrative career on the celebrity circuit, which saw him present BBC music show 6-5 Special, and star in numerous films. But detectives were beginning to look beyond the public persona as a national sporting hero to find a more seedy character. It was becoming clear that Mills had regularly dabbled in the darker underside of London life. The registration number of the boxer's Citroen had been logged several times in the red light districts of West London. More worryingly, prostitutes were handing in reports to police that Mills had behaved violently at a friend's luxury apartment. These lurid reports meant the much-loved boxer was being actively examined by police around the time a sixth woman was found in February 1965. Officers discovered the corpse of Bridget Birdie O'Hara at an industrial estate in Acton. In common with the other victims, she was completely naked. Police believe most of the victims were sexually assaulted. With the Met running out of promising leads and intense pressure exerted by a horrified press and public, a new mind was brought into the mix. Scotland Yard Chief Superintendent John DeRose took over as head of the police investigation around the time O'Hara was discovered. According to Litchfield, this move was instrumental for Mills as he shared a secret in common with DeRose that the boxer would be able to exploit to his advantage. The two men were Freemasons and both boxer and detective knew each other before their paths crossed in the early months of 1965. Clearly fearing he would be dropped as a lead detective if anyone found out, DeRose did not share this fact with his superiors. 
By this point, Mills must have felt the noose tightening around him as police pieced together the evidence to reveal a fuller picture of his character. In return for Mills' admission, DeRose would help him enter a plea for the charges to be dropped from the murder to manslaughter on the grounds he did not intend to kill. Then after a few days of getting his house in order, Mills would hand himself into a London police station. But as it would soon become clear, the boxer intended to do nothing of the sort. According to Litchfield's sources, the prize fighters had left the meeting to visit the Cray brothers, whom he had got to know during his boxing career. There, in what the author thinks was a cowardly bid to evade justice, Mills offered the brothers a thousand pound for them to organise a hitman to gun him down. After agreeing to Mills' terms, the death would be quick and he would not be told the time before. The Cray split the cash and gave the rest to 24-year-old Jimmy Moody. Mills then borrowed a 22 caliber rifle from a friend pretending it was a fancy dress party, a move he hoped would make his death look like suicide. It was then, according to Litchfield, that the champion boxer made an astonishing decision. Believing he could trust a fellow Freemason to keep his word, Mills made contact with DeRose and arranged to meet him at a secretive orders London HQ. Here among the grand decor on the lodge on Great Queen Street, the boxer is said to have confessed to killing all six women. Trusting his fellow Mason, Mills did not think to check for a tape recorder, which DeRose had used to record the entire conversation. The men then struck a deal. With the grubby arrangement completed, Mills dropped the money at the nightclub and left the rifle in his car boot. Then he waited for his fate. It came quickly on July the 25th. He was found dead in his car with the fairground rifle between his knees. A post-mortem by Professor Keith Simpson found the lethal shot had shattered his skull and left no exit hole. He concluded there was no evidence of foul play. Freddie's death was suicide by proxy, murder by appointment and self-financed. Yes, Mills paid a hitman to kill him because he couldn't bring himself to do it. The whole incident was recounted to the author through a police source, Bob Berry, who in turn heard it from gangster Frankie Fraser. The lack of conclusive evidence in the case has meant that thousands of names have been put forward as a potential. Jack the Stripper over the previous decades. Now 52 years since his death, Mills is still remembered as a sporting idol rather than a murderer of incredible callousness. But if Litchfield's book achieves its aim, that will soon change.